<laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome uh, to this week's very special one year anniversary edition. Can you believe it? I think Liz is the only one who made a festive little one year name. Uh, uh, Danny show, but... Thomas? Yeah, one. Uh, that's true. OK, you get credit to <laughs> Danny um, this is the one year anniversary edition of A Sip of Knowledge uh, with your hosts, Marty Duffy, Liz Rhodes, and Lou Bryson, plus very special guest this week, Dave Wondrich, who I will let your host give a more formal introduction to in just a moment. Uh, real quick before we get started, my name is Will Hookinga from Zavi.co. Just want to point out a few different ways you can interact with your hosts uh, throughout the show and submit questions and that sort of thing. So uh, to your right, you'll see a chat box. I know uh, many of you have already discovered that, but please, everyone, feel free to say hello. Let us know where you're joining us from in the world. It's always cool to see that. Uh, if you have a question uh, for your host or for Dave throughout the show, there's a little button at the bottom that says ask a question. That's the best place to enter those <laughs> in. I'll be keeping an eye out for those. And last but not least, uh, feel free to invite your friends to join us. There's a share button at the top that makes it really easy to do that. Uh, but with all that said, Marty, Liz, Lou, the show is yours. Hey, thanks, Will. You are the men and youthful of this show because you make <laughs> shit flow, baby. Mm. Smoothly. That was the best one yet. <laughs> yeah. Easy on the details there, Junior. We're, we're gonna... <laughs> I'm not going into the bowels of the whole oh, please. Now no, we got to stop. <laughs> All right, look. Uh, no, my, different I, drug for that. Everyone, my name is Martin Duffy. I'm a former senior master of whiskey for Diageo. Uh, 14 years. You know, nothing big. Um, and then uh, 18 uh, glorious months as the national brand representative for Benedictine and B&B. &B. You probably Whoa. know me for that. Yeah. And then uh, eight years as the senior, uh, not senior, I was not a senior at all, uh, eight years as co-producer of the Chicago Independent Spirit Expo. And for nearly seven years now, I've been the sole brand representative for Glencairn Crystal, the fine Scottish crystal outside of Edinburgh. <laughs> and uh, one last thing before we go, uh, uh, anyone who uh, can decipher the hyper <laughs> hyperglyphics Hydroglyph, you know, this. Uh, my shirt wins a copy of Lou, 10 copies of Lou's books delivered in person by Liz. Um, <laughs> wow. That Marty's is. bird obviously is wearing the shirt. So it's <laughs> well, I'm exhausted, Lou. So I had to get the shirt, I had to put it on. I'm exhausted. All right, Liz. Yes. Thank you, Marnie. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, really exciting. It's our one-year anniversary show. <laughs> uh, I'm Liz Rhodes, technical support and spirit consultant. Have just over a decade of experience in the alcoholic beverage industry, spanning across several different products and substrates, including beer, rum, vodka. But my particular favorite and expertise is, of course, in whiskey. Um, I spent most of my career at a small little outfit known as Diageo, but now I'm currently <laughs> founder and principal at Spirit Safe Consulting. And hey, wanting to know more about what Spirit Safe Consulting is all about, you can actually scroll down to the About the Host section. There's a little link to my website. So give it a click, check it out. Also, <laughs> check it out. Since it is our one year anniversary show and also coinciding with my one year anniversary in the New York City area, I am celebrating with a little local okay. brand. Woo. All right. All right. So cheers, guys. Thanks for joining. Lou? Cheers. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Liz. Uh, I'm Lou Bryson. I'm a whiskey writer. I've uh, been doing that for over 20 years now. I was the uh, managing editor of Whiskey Advocate magazine for 20 years, and I'm out on my own again. Plug in me book, Whiskey Masterclass, um, and of course the uh, the previous <laughs> book, Tasting Whiskey, which Mr. Wonder wrote the forward for me. Thank you so much. I'm very Again. glad to do it. That's a great book. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and now uh, uh, well, another connection to Dave. We're we're both uh, senior drinks writers at uh, the Daily Beast, and uh, apparently we're both drinking the same whiskey today. Uh, some more of Todd Leopold's Three Chamber Rye. God bless. God bless. This is a taste of pre-prohibition. It's crazy. Yeah. It tastes so, Marty, take it away, brother. All right. Thanks, Lewis. Um, 
Hi, everyone. Uh, since it is our first anniversary, one year anniversary, 52 weeks of this we have done. <laughs> and you watch all of them in a row, just kind of binge it. Out. Binge it. 52 hours worth on, uh, actually more, on YouTube. <laughs> binge watch. Binge watch. Try to get some sleep in between because, all right, actually, some episodes might put you to sleep. But... <laughs> Others like this one, hot. Um, this, so we decided to have a guest that would uh, just. I mean, actually, you think about it, it's been a year, uh, almost a year in review. And who better than a guy who basically reviews history and drinks industry? And who, uh, just a note to you, Dave, notice Lou has written a huge acknowledgement to Marty here. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on that. I'll, I'll work on that. I'll work in your on next that. book, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. or maybe I'll the work. one after that, yeah, <laughs> just because I'll need more space, yeah. All right, don't, not, don't wait too long. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I'll get on it. He's a uh, he's a historian, a, a drinks author, writer, former, former, I believe, uh, editor for Esquire magazine, the drinks editor. Um, and a lot of people say, call him a Renaissance man, mainly because he looks like he used to work at Renaissance fairs. Um, <laughs> it's uh, the author of such books as Punch and Imbibe, Mr. Dave Wunrich. Hey! Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Marty. Uh, well, it's lovely to see you guys, I have to say. You know, I, I wish we were doing this in a studio, though. Yeah. So we could clink our glasses, but, you know. Or McSorley's. We can, McSorley's would do. McSorley's is good. We can at least <laughs> try to aim them at the camera here. And, uh, and, and Pretend you're clinking. I'll just do the sound. There you go. There you go. Okay. <laughs> uh, and that's real crystal right there, friends. Mm. Yeah. Well, Dave, um, as we do every week uh, with our guests, we ask them to bring us on the journey, if you will, um, take us down the path that they walked uh, or flew or rode on a big wheel um, uh, to where you are today. So how the heck did you start? Where were you before and how did you get into drinking, uh, <laughs> drinking and writing about drinking? <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of a weird story because it was completely accidental. Uh, you know, this isn't a career that you're... Uh, Guidance counselor uh, sits you down in high school and says, Dave, uh, looking at your record, I think you'd probably make a good drinks writer. <laughs> you know, don't try anything other other than that. But, uh, you know, you just got to work on the, right, the writing part. The rest of it you've got down. <laughs> but uh, seriously, I was an English professor, uh, which I did because I didn't know what else to do uh, after... Uh, I'd played in rock and roll bands for 10 years and uh, failed to become a rock and roll star. You know, that's just some, there's just something wrong with that industry. I got to say, <laughs> I, I mean, they really, they, they, they really appreciate talent. No, they don't. They, they don't, don't. They don't freaking know talent. They, when they, they just hear don't it. know talent when they hear it. No. A bunch of cloth feared gits. But anyway, uh, so I ended up uh, in grad school when, and they paid for me to read books at NYU for like seven years. So I read books for seven years, which I enjoyed. Uh, but uh, afterwards, I was an English professor, and I didn't enjoy that at all. That's a terrible job, at least uh, the way I did it. Uh, and uh, it was uh, it was just rough and uh, a lot of work, and it just wasn't fun, and uh, I was not enjoying life. So I started writing about music on the side, but not rock and roll music, because those guys, as you know, I was done with them. So I wrote about jazz, and I ended up writing about jazz for the Village Voice, which was still a cool paper and, and still uh, distributed on paper. And uh, that was very fun. I, wrote, I was their second-string jazz critic, and I did all the, like, old-type stuff, all the swing and uh, all, all the jazz that, that, you know, you could dance to that rocked and uh, not not the uh, the kind of stuff that you needed a degree in, in musical arts to appreciate. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I really, I enjoyed that. And uh, somewhere along the way, I started writing a book on it uh, on the side when I was being a professor. But of course, I, wrote, I was really spending most of my time on that because I didn't enjoy the professor stuff. When I get a phone call from my friend, this is like December 
1999. He says, Dave, I know you like cocktails, which I did. I kind of preferred beer, but I like cocktails too. And I'd all, always drunk a lot of cocktails when I was a musician because, uh, you know, old man bars were cheap and that's what they made you. Uh, and uh, so he calls me up. He says, I know, I know you, you like cocktails. And uh, I got a little job that I was wondering if you could do. Uh, he happened to be the new media director for Hearst Magazines. New media director was a new job, and it, it, he, they gave him a little tiny office uh, near the men's room uh, on the ground floor of the Hearst building, <laughs> and uh, you know, and a, and a budget of about you know, not much anyway. And uh, he calls me up and says, you know, can you do this thing, Esquire Magazine, uh, a Hearst magazine, which I didn't know. Uh, has one of their old books that somebody reprinted uh, uh, because they don't own the rights to it. And they're a little ticked off about this. So they th thought they'd put it online uh, and build up their website and also kind of get back at these people who put this, uh, reprinted this book without asking permission. Uh, so uh, can you edit that? And I'm like, no, I can't. I'm really busy. It's, uh, you know, the end of my semester and I've got these music gigs and all this and he goes uh, it it pays and I go pays it's, it's three thousand dollars now for a junior English professor with a two-year-old at home okay came on I am now a drinks writer uh, and uh, so I, I edited this I threw out half the drinks because I was like nobody's gonna drink those including many of my current favorites but uh, mm -hmm. you know I, I was I was pretty ignorant uh, and uh, in the old Esquire book that I was editing, they'd included these little essays for some of the drinks that I thought were real snappy and fun. So I wrote some more of them for some of the other important drinks. And uh, Esquire goes to me, those little essays, can you do one of those a week uh, for the website? Because they needed content. And I was like, I guess so. We will pay. Yes, of course I can. And uh, that's how I ended up as a drink writer. And I, I, I basically started at the top of the profession. I was Esquire's drinks guy. From the website, I got into the magazine. I got a, I, I had them do an Esquire drinks book, which they hadn't done in 20 years. And uh, it should have been 40 years because the one they did 20 years before was absolute crap. Uh, and I kind of went back to their older ones that were funny and said, let's do more of that and, uh, you know, make it lively and uh, make the drinks classic rather than, you know, whatever the bartenders tell them. And as a result of doing that, I had to teach myself how to mix, mix drinks properly. But then I went and got Dale DeGroff to teach me more. And then I forgot all that. And then I went and got him to teach me again. And I finally got it uh, almost down so that I can, you know, make a drink without embarrassing myself and write about drinks without having to call a bartender every 10 minutes. Because if I had to call the bartender every 10 minutes, I'd probably want to go in and see them. And then, you know, nobody's going to get any work done. So, uh, yeah. 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 Well, anyways, I mean, you know how it works. You know how it works. I mean, there, there's stuff to talk about, and it's not whatever stupid shit I'm writing. So I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say words like that on here. But, oh, but, my uh, God. That's not, no problem. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, that's how I got into it, and uh, that led to writing a bunch of books where I could actually put my uh, PhD to work for good rather than evil, and uh, you know, to uh, write about things that people actually care about rather than Renaissance scientific poetry and things like that that I, I used to write about. And uh, so that was uh, that was uh, like I said, I started doing this in 1999. By 2003, I'd quit my academic job, and uh, I've been doing this ever since. And so uh, now you never, you were never a bartender. No, but I, I worked in bars for ten years, though, uh, as a musician. Mm. So you know, I, I spent a lot of time in bars, and uh, I kind of <laughs> knew the atmosphere, knew what bartenders did pretty well, and I, I, I understood the culture. I just never worked behind the bar. Right. Well, uh, I think there's about 300 million people in this country who can say the same thing. Oh, Dave. it's true. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> just so, just so you know, let's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I did. Yeah. I did do a lot of shots. 
and, and, and <laughs> so very frequently. Look, Dave, wondering, well, we want you to write a book about drinking. Uh, go do a lot of shots. Come yeah. on back. Come on back sometime. That's how it works. <laughs> Luke can attest to that. <laughs> My model and all things drink writer. <laughs> He's writing about bathtub gin. He just fills a bathtub full of gin, gets in it, yep. and kind of writes yep. his thoughts. Yep, that's how it works. We learned from Wayne uh, Curtis, so... <laughs> <laughs> That's how he does it. I, I wanted to be Wayne when I grew up, but then I realized it would kill me. So <laughs> uh, there was that time that, that Wayne decided to get high on nutmeg. Uh, you know, internationally famous is the worst thing ever to get high on, and you know Wayne proved it. <laughs> you, get, you get high on nutmeg. So oh, I actually just watched the show about that last night. It was some Australian mystery show. That was like a major plot point. Oh, geez, yeah. Wow. Uh, it's not wow. good. No, this guy wound up temporarily paralyzed. <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh. Well, man, and he got off lucky. Sprinkle it on that dog. That's the only yeah. thing I ever Well, a little know. bit. A little bit is fine. He yeah, these, guys put like, these guys put like two ounces in in a yeah, drink. No, yeah, that's like, too much. Oh, that's pretty as shit. I don't know. I don't know. Really, that's too much. Yeah, I don't know. Really, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Should we be talking about this? We don't want little kids out there. We have a lot of uh, Dave. We have a lot of children who watch. Uh, 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 I'll, I'll start with a question. Well, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, please do before I get yeah, into let's get all the fair ground. My God. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, so obviously you been writing about booze in our industry, cocktails, you've been around booze and the in the bartending scene for a while. Um, I guess, what can you say that's changed either for better, for worse, and what do you kind of see coming up in the, in the future? Uh, uh, what's changed for better, uh, especially in the last 20 years, is the drinks are way better and the booze is way better. You know, a much higher quality is available of both. Uh, the bars are less fun than they used to be, though. Okay. <laughs> you know, because there there were some crazy ass bars uh, that that you used to, that, that, that you would go to, and they'd be having like hermit crab races on a table, and the, like the loser had to like you know stand on their head in a corner while while reciting the Declaration of Independence and everybody throwing <laughs> peanut shells at him. I mean, well, I'm, not, I'm barely making that up. There's this bar <laughs> Sloan's in West Hollywood that if you went to Sloan's, like, holy Hannah, things would go on there and people had fun. Uh, so when this whole cocktail revolution started, we didn't want to get rid of that. We just wanted the drinks to be better. So instead we got like some very nice, serious, elegant bars but we got rid of all that too, unless, uh, I mean, they still exist, but they're kind of dumber uh, than they used to yeah. be. And then the, the, the crowd isn't as mixed as it used to be. The, the, the high end has, uh, has been siphoned off and uh, you know, you need, you need some Tony people in there to uh, throw money around and, and, and just make the place uh, go a little crazy. I, I don't know. That's my theory of bars, I guess. Well, that was the other thing, too, with the evolution of, uh, well, the continuous evolution of cocktails in the last, say, 15 years or so, and the, the rise of the mixologist. <laughs> I say that very much mm -hmm. as in a Star Wars kind of, you know, menacing way, uh, <laughs> only because they, I, I think they, they did sap a little fun out of, um, out of uh, going to a bar. And it also drove up pricing on cocktails. So it did kind of make it some places were places you went once well, in a while as opposed to being your regular place. I mean, you get twice as much booze in one of these small cocktails uh, at, at a uh, craft cocktail bar than you do in a big drink at like the average, you know, oh, yeah. uh, bar I was talking about. They poured things real small. As a matter of fact, New York Magazine in the 70s sent somebody around with a test tube to all of the popular singles bars to order Bloody Marys. And he poured them into his jacket, into the tube half the time, half the time, just went all over the place. Uh, that's my theory. Uh, but anyway, he, he, he got enough of these drinks home into captivity that he could test the alcohol. And uh, one of the most popular of these bars didn't put any alcohol in their Bloody Marys at all. 
Uh, so, oh, I believe you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's there uh, a lot of places that were always jipping you and uh, yeah. all sorts of hinky yeah, stuff. Yeah, so uh, they, 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 might cost, they might cost twice as much, but you're getting, at least you're getting a square product. You know, it's a, uh, it, it, it's kind of different. It's apples to oranges. Of bars, though, you go in, there was uh, bars in Western Illinois University, Macomb, Illinois. They used to charge uh, students five bucks at the door. And yep. then all the oh, captain and coke, drink. you want a drink for a buck, you know, a buck a uh, drink. And they were yeah, these yeah. giant solo cups, the red solo cups. And they are about 95% rum, 5% percent uh because those kids had about three hours to drink. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just done watching TV, went out, and the bars were going to close in three hours. So they, well, I mean, you can still find bars business. like that, like all over the country, even right here in Brooklyn, New York. You know, the 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 heart of the uh, uh, of the beast in in terms of uh, hip mixology right now. Uh, I I could take you to five bars just like that in within a, a twenty minute walk of my house. So, I mean, they exist. It's just we got these others on top of that, I think, is the real difference. Uh, uh, there, there's still plenty of dives and plenty of, of shot bars and, uh, and mm -hmm. things like that. But, you know, places where you're drinking cocktails, the cocktails are a lot better. Oh, yeah. Well, like you said, the booze is a lot better, the stuff going yeah. in them. Martinis are smaller, yeah. though, because martinis used to be uh, eight yeah. ounces at least. And there oh, was yeah. never any vermouth in them. So uh, yeah. <laughs> those were just freaking paralyzing. Yeah. I can't drink those yeah. anymore. They used to be bar I don't even want to. Chicago. They used to have 10-ounce martini glasses. And oh. I get a dirty Tangray gin martini. And yeah. they filled it to till there was oh, a my God. Oh, yep. wow. I had three of those back in my heyday. Can't yeah, I, 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 can't, I can't do that anymore. Yeah. I almost... Yeah. I almost, uh, I'm almost glad that I can't. Yeah. Dave, let's talk about your books. You got two very prominent ones, very influential ones, uh, that came out. Um, one that well, I was very familiar with, uh, especially when I was working for Benedictine because turned out Benedictine oh, yeah. went into a lot of punches. That was the only way I could sell a bottle. <laughs> um, yeah, a punch bowl. Uh, uh, um, come on. People, people should use more Benedictine. It's, Great in cocktails. I love it. Preach into it. Yeah. They, they just put a little, yeah, yeah. little dab bit. behind your ear is good also. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> they got rid of me because I, I I think after 18 months, there was like, uh, you haven't really sold many bottles. That's because everyone still has their original bottle on the back bar. Yeah. <laughs> they use symbols full. Yeah. Well, um, that's what, what it's best that? for. I, I mean, I don't know if they're working that because of the uh, the Frisco cocktail that you had yeah. in your column that one yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love the Frisco. Yeah. That was I my favorite. I drink the shit one. out of those when I get a chance. Oh, yeah. they're delicious. Uh, uh, anyway, yeah. Imbibe. Uh, imbibe uh, started out, I was going to do a uh, annotated edition of Jerry Thomas. And just, you know, like a good academic that I had just recently been. And I was going to just take his book and write a whole lot of footnotes. And after doing that for about three days, I said, screw it. What would Jerry Thomas have done? He would not have done it this way. Let me, let me, let me, let me step back and do it the right way. And, you know, let me, uh, let me just, uh, just uh, let loose on this stuff. So that's basically what I did. And uh, I was fortunate. This was the beginning of uh, databases of, searchable databases oh. of newspapers and, peri and periodicals. Mm -hmm. And so I got in right when that stuff started. And well, I was that. fortunate yeah. to, to, to pluck all the low hanging fruit, you know, on, on, on this kind of thing, because I was there and I had a book contract so uh, I could do it. And uh, now it's a lot harder to find it, to find stuff that hasn't been, been uh, told a million times, but uh you well, know, it was all right crazy there. These people who give it away for free, you know, the damn bloggers are like just writing this <laughs> shit every third day, and they're not getting paid for it. I'm like, shut up! Yeah, shut just up. So I you know, selling that. Dave, I'll, I'll put the occasional thing out on Twitter just as a as a loss leader, but uh, you know, 
<laughs> but I'll make sure to save it for the uh, for articles and books and stuff. Yeah. Well, I, were you the guy that I mean, Jerry Thomas seemed to pop out of nowhere. I mean, he was kind of the 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 long lost hero of, of cocktails and mixologists, and I never heard much about him. I I bartended throughout the nineties, uh, and I never heard about him until the aughts. Right, and probably in the mid aughts, in the whole blue blazer and everything else. But you know, before that, I mean, was that you? Was that you in this book? That well, really... it, it, in a way, it was. What what happened was, uh, I was at somebody's birth part, birthday party on Smith Street here in Brooklyn in a bar uh, and restaurant that uh, I, I'm not making this up. I swear that uh, featured toast. That was what they made. They made and served toast. Uh, and so I thought that was pretty silly, but, uh, the, the, uh, I'm here at this birthday party and I'm talking to some people and, and, uh, they, they, it turns out they were from slow food, the, uh, the organization, mm -hmm. you know, that, that yeah. had an American branch, the Italian organization dedicated to, you know, foodways and, and traditional things. And I was talking to them and I said, you know, American bartending is like a real, uh, slow food type thing and we should do a, a an event and you know why not let's do like a tribute to jerry thomas who uh you know is is pretty much forgotten ex except by like you know a few cocktail geeks and he was the most famous bartender in america and i've several drinks in and i've loaded up pretty pretty heavily on toast so uh, you know i'm feeling no pain uh just a little crummy yeah, and uh, <laughs> sorry about that. I had to, uh, but uh, so I, I I was just making you know bar bullshit talk, and they uh, all said yes, let's do it. Let's have a meeting next week, and we did. And it was Alan Katz, who now owns okay. the New York Distilling Company. Yeah. It was yeah. Sean Kelly, who is now uh, the director of PR at Cocktail Kingdom, and Anna Jovanchichovich, who is this demon uh, PR person like excellent PR person. And uh, we actually did a tribute to Jerry Thomas at the Plaza Hotel in their Oak Room, which used to be their men's bar. And uh, we had the late uh, much lamented Gary Regan. We had uh, the late much lamented Sasha Petrosky. We had uh, George, uh, I cannot remember, remember his last name, sadly also late, who was the head bartender at the Plaza who had attended bar at the black and white ball, Truman Capote's black and white ball in the 60s. So he was cool just by being, you know, uh, uh, an old timer. Uh, we had Robert Hess. We had Ted Hay, Dr. Cocktail. Uh, we had Audrey Saunders. We had Dale DeGroff, the mighty and mighty and indestructible. And, uh, and we had me making drinks. And uh, I used a little of our budget to get a case of Batavia Ar Arak air freighted from Germany uh, because I had never tried it before, but I was going to make Arak punch, God damn it. And I did. And it was delicious. And everybody, you know, we had Blue Blazers and Tom and Jerry's. Uh, we had uh, the great Terry Waldo playing ragtime piano. Even if that was 50 years too late, it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, uh, it still sounded great. We had uh, fresh oysters and a whole free lunch spread. Uh, and we, we got uh, the lovely folks at uh, Hennessy to pay for it. So it was phenomenal. God bless them. That's sweet. You know, 150 guests and every one of them who, you know, went on to open a bar or do something in the business. So all that, though, with Jerry Thomas started the obligatory uh, bartenders wearing vests, which in a way I kind of liked. I liked everyone all of a sudden now dressing up, but they all had the curly mustache and they all looked like they just walked out of the gay 90s. And, yeah, uh, or, you know, not one the of those. No, they, they're. No. They, they down the mustache. One woman I knew, but, she had a curly mustache. Yeah, yeah. I, I did ten bar once with a woman who had a glue glue on uh, uh, handlebar mustache, and it was very amusing. Nice. Yeah. yeah, yeah, she was like, "God damn it, I'm doing it too." Um, I mean, it, it, facial hair. It looked like one of those banjo ice cream parlors of the 1970s for a while there, you know, where everybody had ice cream parlor chairs and and you know. I uh, one of those. 
Uh, what am I not surprised, the, Marty? <laughs> we had the little styrofoam hat and the vest and the yep, little bow tie. Yep, and yep, yep. See? I'm on my hands and knees picking up the pig trough ice cream that uh, some wheat just <laughs> Horrible. Worst well, job I ever had. For, fortunately, now uh, that's kind of uh, faded into the background some, which I, I'm, mm -hmm. I, I'm relieved about. I do feel a little responsible for some of that. But, you know, it, it did it did help uh, – in getting bartenders to take the shit seriously and to learn the history yeah. of their profession, which every profession, if you're going to be good in your profession, you have to know the history of your profession a little bit. I mean, just, you know, just mm -hmm. because that's where all the good tricks are to steal. But I mean, see, that's that stuff's I, lying around. And not to, uh, not yep. to uh, bemoan these guys, but uh, it also started the whole trend of all these bartenders trying to become the next big star to be the next Jerry Thomas and trying to reinvent things like the gin and tonic. You ever taste oh, some of those? Yeah. Reinventions of the oh, gin no, and some tonic of those drink? are not good, but I will say for the bartenders, a lot of them have become very successful doing that. And in fact, are the next Jerry Thomas, you know, I mean, some of these people you, you watch like, uh, Charles Jolie behind the bar, or uh, or Charles you know Jackson. any of any of the women who uh, who compete in uh, in uh, speed rack. Oh my God! You know they're just they are just sharks. They're terrifying. Uh, just uh, how good they are and how fast they are. And uh, I mean, it, it really is a, a golden age for this. And. Obviously, some people are going to be less good at it, and and then, then it's kind of embarrassing. But the best bartenders I know are completely relaxed, know all the jokes, and can make you any drink you can ever think of. You know, yeah, that's and that's what we wanted. Hospitality, right? Like that's that's yeah. the first, yeah, yeah. Bit, right? <laughs> so, Charlie, yeah, for a while there, I thought it was going to be a one or the other situation. They could yeah. make good drinks, or they could be good bartenders. But you're getting well, they're smart people, and they figured that out, too, you know? I yeah, mean, yeah. going to bar industry things over the last three or four years, all the talk has been about hospitality, about, like, all right, let's not, you know, do that thing with the tweezers and have people lined up for hours at the bar while we, yeah. you know, paint our masterpiece in booze. Uh, let, let, let's try to uh, get, you know, people a little looser, and, you know, let's learn some jokes and... Uh, and you know, play. Let's let's relax a little bit. Uh, let's play better music, and you know, do do all that kind of stuff. Well, if you want, I think you can find it on YouTube. Is Charles Jolie's uh, final uh, bit for the uh, the Diageo uh, wor mm -hmm. World Class, and that is how I would expect it. Uh, that's the perfect bartender. And Charles was talking. He's, you know, he's not heavy breathing. He's looking at everybody while he's making his drink. He's making the drink. He serves it up. He's adding flair to it. Not the juggly flair, but actual, you know, presentation. Yeah. And it was great. And he'd go, yeah. that, I would go to that bar every day until I die. In a yeah, I mean, that's... You know, that's what that's what we've won over the last 20 years, you know, and that's yeah. precious. That was hard run, hard won. But we've got it. And, you know, every city in the country now, even the small ones, uh, even like yeah. towns. I mean, shit, I know these guys opened a world-class cocktail bar in Keshecton, Pennsylvania, on the Delaware River. That town has uh, six houses, and one of them is a cocktail bar. And the locals <laughs> drink there, too. The locals love it. They've learned, nice. you know, they've learned that Actually, you, yeah. you you get like well, once you once you have like a Queens Park swizzle, and you've tasted it, you're not going to go back to that other stuff. Uh, the locals are lined up. The 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 summer people are lined up. Everybody's lined up to to, and and that's in the middle of of, of technically in the middle of nowhere. Who's you know, not going to line up for the Queens Park swizzle? I mean, exactly. You Once you have, have one, you know, it, it, it's, you got to, uh, well, you're going to line up on the ground. <laughs> They're going to stack you up. <laughs> Which it is, and, and what is a Queen's Park Swizzle? A uh, Queen's Park Swizzle is uh, Demerara rum, uh, Demerara sugar syrup, lime juice, uh, swizzled, all swizzled together with mint, um, mm. muddled in there and piled high on in, in a glass full of crushed ice and you could top it i like to 
uh, top it with a cap of Angostura bitters. And okay. uh, oh boy. And I, by, by rum, I mean like three ounces of rum. So, uh, and strong <laughs> rum, please. So, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's uh, very anesthetic. Where'd the name <laughs> come from, Dave? That came from the Queen's Park Hotel uh, uh, in Trinidad on the Queen's Park Savannah yeah. there in the heart of the Port of Spain. And it was what they served on the veranda, which they used to have. Now the hotel is gone, but. Uh, oh. I was, was going to say, I thing. this I drink is the veranda. That's just how I roll. Yeah, well, fair enough. Yeah. Everybody wants to live on the veranda and drink veranda uh, drinks. Now, another book of yours is one that, like I said, when I was uh, <laughs> pushing Benedictine, this was important to me. Um, uh, and I found this really fascinating because there's uh, so much history. And, uh, you know, things like Washington. I didn't know Martha and George. That's how they basically drank their drinks, man. <laughs> Those guys, well, man, you know, got done being president. You had to relax. Yeah, yeah. Every, everybody drank in America back then, pretty much. But uh, no, that, that book is uh, my favorite of my books. I think it was the the one that I did the best job on, Punch. And uh, just uh, now, uh, I got a royalty statement for it. The first time ever, it finally earned out after ten years. So uh, wow. I feel vindicated maybe just a little bit that uh, enough people finally bought it. And it wasn't a huge advance, but uh, it, 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 it's been a little bit of a disappointment commercially because I think the world wasn't ready for punch. They were ready for cocktails, but uh, I'm always ready for punch. I've made more punch since that book came out, like unbelievable oceans of it, uh, you know, rivers of it, ponds of it, uh, just so much punch. I peeled so many lemons. Uh, right but around, I think it was right around uh, 20, 2012, 2013, 2011, 2012. Um, I was going around to a number of cocktail bars with Benedictine, and um, uh, I saw a lot of punch bowls. In fact, uh, yeah. Broken Shaker's first place in Florida, uh, they offered, I thought it was such a great idea, they had a punch bowl offered it, you it, a drink while you're waiting for your cocktail. Oh, yeah. It's a great way of getting people something to drink while waiting for their craft cocktails that you're using the tweezers on. So yes. uh, it, it's really good for that. And But it's, you know, it's great for entertaining. It's, uh, it's a great social ritual. Uh, now that we're starting to be able to gather again, I've, I, I've finally had a bunch of vaccinated people over and, uh, and we, uh, we all... Uh, Toasted our good fortune to still be alive. Thank you very much. Uh, with a big bowl of punch, and uh, it was just so great. I missed it. Like I missed that ritual, you know. Of, and and everybody gathers around the punch bowl, and you ladle it out. And as you do, you talk to everybody, and you know people come and go, and and it, it's really social. It's it's a lovely thing to do. It's like the water cooler for people over twenty one. Exactly. And then by the end of the day, people are passing the punch bowl around and trying to take the last sip. If it's a glass bowl, uh, they, uh, my friend Derek Brown from D.C. calls that the astronaut shot because it looks like you've got an astronaut helmet on. <laughs> um, I know we were talking about thrift shops earlier, but punch bowls, great, great place to pick up. Oh, my God. Punch. Especially yeah. in, like, rural Pennsylvania. Uh, <laughs> oh, Lou, I, I got yeah. fantastic punch bowls, complete with trays and sets uh, of, oh, nice. of, of glasses oh, and glass yeah. ladles for under twenty dollars each at, in uh, Honesdale at nice. the Salvation what? Army. There, amazing. Uh, I commissioned a whole bunch of Benedictine punch bowls and with matching Fabulous. glass. And uh, they're, love it. they're now at. They're now collecting they're dust somewhere yeah. because they didn't have Marty to. Push up. I mean, I think I can get them. I know, you know we were talking about uh, about rock and rye before the star uh, the show started, and uh, I thought of the first time I saw somebody drinking rock and rye, which is in a uh, a little dive bar called the Shamrock in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I was uh, <laughs> going to college at the time, and I think it was like the night before New Year's Eve, so the 30th, mm -hmm. and it was just 
it was sloppy. You know, we were in there. We were in there because you could get these sixty-four ounce pitchers of Strohs for a buck and a half. And that oh, was okay, drink. that's a deal. Yeah, yeah. And this guy had had the last shot of Rock and Rye in the bottle. And he's like, "Can I have the bottle?" And like, "Yeah." So they give him the bottle. And he takes a knife. And he's up there trying to cut the pouring spout out of the bottle so he could get the fruit <laughs> that was in the. <laughs> oh, wow. Jesus! No, wow. you don't want you don't want Last that stuff. Minute. You don't know where no. that's been. <laughs> <laughs> oh uh, man! Yeah. Well, people, yeah. you know, There's you can see that at any bar, really. I mean, yes. even at the Rainbow Room, you you know, if it got late. <laughs> Hey, uh, Dave, uh, Larry Cass, formerly of Heaven Hill, a retired uh, Heaven Hill. Uh, Larry's an old and dear friend of mine. What a, what a great guy. Yeah. I'll see him next week. We're going with uh, Veach on a tour of the Cave Hill Cemetery. Oh, fun. You check out uh, yeah, yeah, all yeah, the yeah. tours. Um, but he said to ask you uh, about how you, your role in getting Rittenhouse into New York City. He says, without his and therefore my insistence, Max would have spent the two hundred dollar registration fee. Would have spent. <laughs> uh, well, okay. <laughs> that 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 is totally true, and you know the amount of revenue they've extracted out of New York City with that stuff uh, since they the, they brought it in there is truly staggering. Uh, but, I think I might have actually seen that conversation. I think I was. I remember you and yeah. him talking in the at the seal box. Uh, Jesus. Well, okay. Uh, I came across. I, I had tried this stuff out in California. I think uh, Ted, hey, Doctor Cocktail, uh, poured me some, and I was very, very impressed. This was a hundred proof rye. There was no such thing at the time, except for Wild mm -hmm. Turkey One Hundred One, and that was hard to get, and uh, you know, kind of came and went. And uh, this stuff had a kind of weird, cool design, and. I was just, uh, I really dug that it was a Pennsylvania brand, Rittenhouse. I was born in Pittsburgh, so other end of the state, but still good enough. And uh, I'd started doing a little bar consulting, and, uh, oh, what happened was I, I was writing a rye piece for Esquire, well, my, my first or second. I wrote rye pieces every, like, as often as I could. They let me do it about once every two years. Uh, and uh, I called up Larry Cass, whom I'd met on a Discus Distilled Spirit Council event, and uh, I had his number. Uh, and uh, I called up Larry Cass and I said, I would like, uh, Larry, if you could do it, uh, if you could send me a bottle of Rittenhouse rye, uh, because we can't get it in New York and I want to write about it for Esquire. So Larry uh, called up the guys in the warehouse and said, you know, send this gink in New York. Uh, oh, let's be generous. Send him two bottles of Rittenhouse. That's $26 bottles dollars worth of whiskey right there. You know, let's, let's, let's splurge. I think Max would not would have said no to that, too. He would have said one bottle is good enough. Come on. <laughs> Make it a small one. Right there. Make it a small one. <laughs> you know. But uh, so I get these two bottles of Rittenhouse and I open them up. And uh, this stuff is remarkably good. And it's got this little neck band that says 10 years old on it. And I'm like, wow. I call Larry up. I said, Larry, uh, you got to explain something to me because I'm writing this up. How can you sell 10-year-old whiskey for 13 bucks a bottle? And he goes, what do you mean 10 years old? I said, well, the, the bottle says 10 years old. He said, wait, look at that bottle. What does it say? 70 centiliters. Ah, these were for the Maison de Whiskey in uh, Paris, that they'd specially bottled it for them and for some sh uh, store in Tokyo. And the warehouse guys see Esquire magazine. They're like, which one do we send? Do we send the, re the regular crap or this, uh, you know, this stuff? <laughs> and uh, so I had two bottles of 10-year-old written house that nobody else in America had. I felt like finally I, I found a good job. I still have, I still have half of one. I, don't yeah, know I, st I still have an open. unopened one because yeah. later I researched the history of, of Rittenhouse for them, of the brand. And, and uh, I asked them to pay me a case in, with a case of, of the stuff. And all they had left was six bottles. So I said, I'll take it. Uh, and and uh, I still have one bottle left. Nice. Uh, thank God. 
and I'm saving that to drink probably when I get off the uh, our conversation here. <laughs> <laughs> Because uh, it's wow. delicious, it's really it's really good whiskey. You know, it was, uh, it was very good whiskey. But anyway, so uh, I, I after that I called Larry again later once I was consulting. Said, "Can you get this stuff in New York?" And because uh, I'm doing this big restaurant that's opening, and I said, "He said I think I can." And uh, a couple months later, we're getting to uh, near opening. I'm like, "Come on, where is this stuff?" I call him again. He said, "Oh." It should be, you know, in the distributor's warehouse. I called the distributor and they said, oh, we, uh, yeah, we just sold that to Linnell. Uh, to, uh, Linnell Smothers uh, had come in and uh, saw it in, in the warehouse there. And she ran this great uh, boutique liquor store in Brooklyn. And uh, she just said, yoink, and took all of my rye, both cases of it. We got all two cases from New York State. Of, of written house uh, bonded rye, but uh, that told me that I wasn't the only one who was interested in this stuff, and uh, and then uh, it uh, turned out to uh, do pretty well for for uh, for written house and for uh, for heaven hill. But it was very, you know, the early days. Uh, I mean, you you guys remember uh, rye was. Not something oh, yeah. the Kentucky people were interested in at all. Those people. Here's Most the people. old overhaul. I, I, I was told yeah. that the total sales of rye in, I think it was, I want to say 98, was 16,000 yeah. cases. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I'll, I'll, I would always ask about rye, and all the all the people in Kentucky would say, son, oh, rye, well, we spill more bourbon in a year than we distill rye. <laughs> And I go, well, maybe, you know, if you made a little more, you might sell it. Nah. <laughs> oh, actually, that was something I wanted to ask because you and Hansel and I and a couple of other people were always freaking talking about rye in the late 90s, yeah, early on. That helped. What did it? Was it was it the people we talked to? Was it something else? It was because something people turned talking around. about it uh, in the media. It was bartenders especially getting on to like the old time yeah. Jerry Thomas kick. It was the yeah. fact that rye makes a uh, more kind of biting cocktail, you know, than, than, than bourbon. It's, it's a little leaner and it makes, it makes a cocktail that really kind of grabs you by the lapels. Uh, it makes a great old fashioned and, and, you know, a great Manhattan uh, bourbon makes a good one too. I mean, I did blind tastes. I did once for Esquire and I found uh, number one was 100 proof rye. Number two was 100 proof bourbon. Number three was 80 proof rye. Number four was, was 80 proof bourbon. So, you know, they're kind of neck and neck, but, but rye yeah. has a little edge. And uh, the cocktail geeks were all about little edges. You know, with anything that's like, and plus it was different and old timey, you know, it was hard yeah, to find. Right. So you could get it at my bar. Oh, oh no, uh, we use rye in our Manhattans. You know, it was, it was that, that, that had a lot to, a lot of, uh, of sort of sexiness uh, to it at the time. Well, we're, you know? well, we're comparing the two. Did there was, and this was actually something I, I haven't been thinking about for a long time. It just, did rye go into wood about the same time as bourbon? Was it in earlier or? Uh, I think the first mention of, uh, Charred barrels, I know, is from 1824 from a guy in Washington, Pennsylvania, uh, oh, writing that saying, if you put your uh, whiskey in a charred barrel, it improves the flavor and it takes on color much faster, which means you can huh. sell it quicker. Yeah. And that yeah. Washington, Pennsylvania is Washington, in the heart of, of, of rye country. It's yeah. right south of Pittsburgh. It's So, you know, I mean, it's about the same time. Uh, bourbon... Uh, is in Chard Oak right after that, and that's yeah. when they when people start talking about old whiskey is in the eighteen huh. twenties. It's all in the eighteen twenties when American whiskey starts to like uh, move up from being like frontier commodity to like a uh, quality product, and uh, that was that was a big that was a, a moment there. The rye was yeah. was always there. Okay. Hey, uh, just real quick, I would just want to give a shout out, Dave. I, you're already world renowned, uh, mainly for your Wait. beard. Yeah, uh, I would but, know. <laughs> but also for your writing. Uh, just so you know, uh, we have uh, Brad from Panama. 
Stephen Wright, the comedian, uh, says hello to Liz. <laughs> hey, but he Steve. says it really very slow and dryly. He's hello, like, hello. hello, Liz. Like that. <laughs> uh, Christina from Germany. Amazing. Uh, Stephen from San Francisco. Uh, Austin Keaton, Austin, uh, just big fan of mine. So I just threw that in there. Um, uh, Kim from Belgium, Patrick from Louisville, Michael from Richmond, Virginia. Uh, oh, Richmond's Eve. a fun town. Crazy Eve from France. I don't know if he still lives in France, but he's from France. Um, uh, Martin, uh, from England, all the way from England. Uh, who else we got? Phenomenal. Oh, and then uh, we have uh, Graham, Graham from Scotland. Hello. Oh, wow. Well, well, hello, usually everyone. scattered bunch even for us. And yeah. Christina did say happy anniversary. So thank you, Christina. Uh, thank you there you for go. Joining us. Richard from New Zealand. Coming awesome. Today. Andrew from California. Yeah, there we are. Everybody. Uh, hey, you know what? what we're, I'm conscious of time. So I, there's a couple of different things we got to hit on. Yeah. It, talk about. Awkward. Oh, about awkward. Yes. Marty, yeah. That was what you're gonna say, right? Talk about awkward. No. Yeah, let's let's talk about the awkward companion. The awkward companion. Oh, awkward. Awkward. Yeah. Well, first, actually, I wanted to leave that for second, only because there's also the bar five. Uh, bar five program that Dave has been involved with with the such uh, luminaries as Dale DeGroff, Paul Packold. Uh, Stephen Olson, uh, I, for some reason, have always been left out, but other uh, luminaries. We're working on version 2.0. <laughs> like, bring in the younger guys. Yeah. Like, but, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Probably older. Well, yeah, me. this is our, uh, we've been doing this since, I think our first one was in 2006. So it's been Jeez. a very long time ago. Holy crap. Really? Uh, that we've been teaching uh Bartenders, spirits, and, and mixology. It's mostly tasting and uh, a bunch of sort of the uh, outer edges of mixology, some of the more interesting stuff and history and all that. And uh, and then we test you mixing drinks for us, which is very, very stressful for people. Uh, yeah. And uh, we've got some new partners over the last couple of years, Julie Reiner, Sean Kenyon from Denver, uh, Charlotte Voicey, the great... Uh, whiskey uh ambassador and 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 now you know executive i mean she, and and just a person who's a demon bartender and all-around great person so and, you know julie reiner there's no better uh, bar operator in the world than julie and bartender and uh, sean kenyon uh, the the great uh bartender bar owner whiskey whiskey guy from denver so we've got uh We've been we've been working on getting new, some new uh, people into uh, into the business, and it's it's been very fun. Liz distilling, just working on it. Hey, come on, that's, uh, minds. Or, and she's just across the river, right across the river. <laughs> take a canoe across over into Manhattan. Yeah, it's like a canoe. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. Just paddle paddle, paddle right over. You're distilling <laughs> products in the canoe. No problem. Yeah. How does someone get into? Uh, how would a bar? Uh, you go. You go to our website, uh, beveragealcoholresource.com, and you uh, you put in an application. And if there's space for you, you know, we Is it uh, for industry folk. No, anybody can do it. Uh, it's recommended that you already have some experience, though, because right. I mean, it's it's a pretty hard class. <laughs> it's uh, five days. Uh, now there's going to be an online component uh, to get uh, uh, some of the stuff that uh, we've just been having trouble getting to. We're going to put uh, online first, and then that'll let us focus more on tasting when when we meet up again next January. So uh, it's a it's a it's a crazy thing. It's it's quite a business. Uh, I try to Go ahead, Liz. I was like going to say it's like the CIA of the drinks. Uh, in 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 a way, you know, it's it's it's, it's very concentrated though. So it's like you know, it's one week uh, plus yeah. a lot of home study. And now, like like we said, we'll have these uh, Zoom sessions, which will at least enable you to ask all your questions uh, when when okay. things are a little calmer. So, uh, but uh, we're we're moving ahead with it. It's uh, been a rough year. We had to uh, suspend it this January for obvious reasons, but uh, we're coming back. 
I tried to convince Lou to do his own bar five, and he just went to a bar for five days. Well, uh, that's that's how it me. starts. That's how it starts. <laughs> that's, how it starts. Know, that's, called, that's called a fact finding mission, Marty. Yeah. <laughs> I was kind of hoping they'd run that uh, three day blow in Pittsburgh again. That was a good. I know time. that was fun. That was fun. Yeah. Well, I don't know. You know, all, all these events are going to struggle back cautiously. We'll see what happens. Yeah. I don't see myself traveling as much as I was, and I think I'm probably grateful for that. But uh, well, I'll uh, be your canary in the coal mine because I'm. Let us know. Uh, I'll, yeah, so, well, you'll know <laughs> if you read my obituary. <laughs> you'll know. Uh, <laughs> don't go out. That's confidence. Uh, no. How about that awkward companion? Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah uh, I've been working for this on this for almost ten years uh, since I since I was roped into it, uh, and it's the Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails, and uh, we we're trying to make it a little different. We're trying to use as much new information as we can uh, to feed it into the system, so to speak. And, you know, it's spirits and cocktails, accurate histories of, of cocktails, of bartenders, of uh, from the past, of bars, famous distillers. bars, uh, distillers, uh, select spirits companies, distillation, uh, uh, all kinds kinds of history stuff and we're covering uh, spirits as a global thing not just as something that mm. happens in the US Canada Mexico and Western Europe so we've got uh, extensive coverage of Baiju we've got uh, coverage of J Japan and Japanese spirits we've got palm spirits from Africa we've got all kinds of stuff uh, you know and we're really uh, made a, a big push to 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 cover more of that to cover uh, distilling in much more detail than is usual for these things. So we've got all kinds of pot stills uh, that aren't the usual Western kind. We've got details on them. We've got uh, you know more detail on uh, on uh, column distillation. We've got the uh, I've got the only picture in captivity of a Stein still. I've got his patent diagram. Nobody's ever seen that. Oh, it wow. just does not exist online. And this thing is bonkers. It is the craziest looking device. No wonder nobody used it. I mean, one, <laughs> there was there was one still working in the 1880s, I think. But everybody else was like, mm, that thing, no, it's just a little too much. It, it, it's like a horizontal column with uh, horsehair membranes between all these compartments uh, and a carburetor for each compartment injecting the wash as a spray into it as the steam goes through the horsehair. <laughs> This thing is nuts. It is just absolutely it's great. It's, ch it's chamber esque. It's chamber esque. It's, I mean, it worked. It's just, it, it's the long way around. You know, then you yeah. look at, at, at uh, like the, the coffee still, and it's like, thing. Oh, this thing absolutely makes sense. You can yeah. almost, you know, figure it out on your own. But this, <laughs> this other thing, oh my God, it's just crazy. It's the craziest an Irishman, Irishman comes in, shows a little common sense. That's all. Exactly. As always, you know, yeah. in this world. That's how it goes. Um, and I don't know if I'm if correct, if I'm wrong, there's some famous people who've contributed to this book as well. well. Uh, let's see. There's Liz Rhodes has contributed. Thank Liz. you, Liz. Yeah, there's Liz. Uh, yeah. Lou Bryson gets yeah. his own section. Obligatory uh, Lou Bryson section. Am I, I, I don't think I'm forgetting anybody. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> of course, Marty Duffy has contributed to it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sorry. A narrow right. escape there. <laughs> I already have that on my resume, so you got yeah. <laughs> uh, to cut that out. Uh, you're nearly done, right? After yeah. you mentioned 10 years, it's coming due to publish in October? In October. It's out. We've got the cover. We've got, uh, oh, wow. you know, nice. we've got everything. It's they're just a couple last minute entries that need need a little uh, more work. By Love. which I mean writing from scratch. <laughs> <laughs> and will I believe we have oh, a yes. link? Is it? Is it down there? Oh, yes, the green. Yeah, it is, can see these things. is it under the stream? It is, is under the stream. stream. Is that uh, the birds the stream? out? The birds aren't out yet, but there is a green box. <laughs> it is under the oh, that's good. That you can click for pre-ordering. So yes. check that and, out. Uh, 
we hope people will enjoy it. It's it's a it's a crazy, you know, it's a crazy project. Uh, every entry has a little bibliography, including some very uh, useful books that took a long time to dig up. So uh, hopefully, it'll be a help for people, you know, wanting to find more. And it's you know a little uh, introduction onto every topic and. I see Brad's comment here. Can't wait for the book. My friend Garrett did the one on beer. Hope you have a thick skin because you'll get a lot of feedback, not all positive. Uh, oh, I, I know I will because yeah. uh, Garrett yeah. is the one who wrote me into this. God damn it, <laughs> <laughs> Garrett. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's 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 going to be. You know, the problem with a book like this is you can't cover everything, uh, and mm. uh, you're bound to to get a couple things. Uh, wrong and, and uh some people know one topic very very well and, yeah. and this we're more like uh, a lot of the topics have not been written about before in detail or or much and uh, uh there are going to be some mistakes but the the key is to put together a first edition because if there's a first edition you've got something that you can correct and yeah. uh I'm, I'm hoping people will send corrections because i really yeah, want to get to a second edition and and really like really knock it out of the park. The first one is is uh, you know is going to be there's a lot of mind blowing stuff in it. But uh, hopefully uh, we'll get to correct the mistakes and, uh, and, uh, and 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 fill in the holes and really go to town on on, on round two. Yeah, you know, you know, you were talking before how you're you're kind of the myth buster of cocktails. Um, you know where. Uh, you know, take away the whole Lady Churchill in the Manhattan thing. But when you, you when you guys contacted me, your publisher did, to write the bit about the old fashioned, I actually had no idea that Chicago was the closest thing to the home of yeah. the old fashioned. I, that blew me away. I thought, wow, this piece of Chicago history that uh, I wasn't aware of until I started digging into it. Well, I mean, this is what I've learned about myth busting. Uh, it's no good to just bust the myths. Then you got to find the real story. And the yeah. real story is yeah. always interesting, you know, because it's yeah, people. It and, yeah. uh, and, and, and it's your responsibility to make sure it's as interest. It reads as interesting as it is. So, you know, you can't just take away people's stories. You got to replace them with, with better stories mm -hmm. is, is my, uh, is my rule, or at least, you know, as good or, or, uh, at least you know keep it there's something there because uh yeah once you get behind the old fashion which you know it says one guy uh, invented it uh, the the conventional wisdom uh in, in in louisville it turns out he wasn't even a bartender when they said he invented it uh he was he was a, a wood carver and and he was like 22 years old so he he's out but then you find, oh, Chicago, you know, and it's everywhere in Chicago in, in like the early 1880s. You're like, okay, now that's a story because Chicago in the 1880s was, was off the hook. I mean, that was a pretty wild place. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you get, you get some really good stories out of that. Yeah. I, uh, I have stories of my great, great, great grandpappy in Chicago uh, during those times. Basically he was, uh, he was a gangster that Al Capone kind of based himself off. I'm totally wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but it, we were talking right a little bit before the show started, and it seems like those are sort of the, the type of stories or articles or things you like to write about is about sort of rectifying um, misinformation, or is it more to it? Well, so, sometimes it's that. If I see something that's just, you know, wrong or unknown, I always get curious because I wonder mm. what's going on. You know, I've always been, I was always a curious kid. I was a very annoying child. Uh, it, it, it's like, what's going on there? Let me take it apart. I don't know how to put it together. Again, no, you're kidding. I just wanted to take it apart. <laughs> so uh, annoying and destructive kid. But um, so I want to like see, you know, if there's something to be learned there, sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't, uh, you know, uh, at least by me, other, other, other people have, have been successful often, but, uh, other things I like to write about is just weird shit that I come across and that makes me scratch my head. It's like, huh, 
that's that's you know like there's this one bartender popo galsini uh, uh who was a tiki bartender in california in the 1950s and i came across while researching something else one article about him and i was like wait uh, i haven't seen this information before i wonder if there's more <laughs> Six thousand words later, yes, you know there is more on Popo Galsini, and it turns out he's like the Zelig of California uh, in in the, in the in the forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, and eighties. He died in the early eighties uh, at attending bar at eighty years old, uh, wow. and uh, he had a habit of marrying underaged women uh, for a while in his youth. He kept, you do uh, well. He was, you know, this. A uh, short Filipino guy who was mostly bald and very kind of funny looking, but he but he certainly got over, and uh, he had all this other weird stuff going on with him. But he was everywhere. He was at every bar, every tiki bar in Southern California. He worked at at one point or another, and you know it's like stuff like that. That's what I get interested in. It's just like because there's a story there, you know. Yeah. There's like there's just something, you know. He ends up at the first fine fine dining restaurant in Orange County. We've got like our French chef and behind the bar, Popo Galsini. <laughs> which wasn't even his name. That was his name so he could what? get bigamously married. His his name was uh, Galsim and he changed it to the Italian Galsini because he just got married in the same town six months before. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> wow. Yeah, Maybe so, he just had a, an extra O uh, to uh, both syllables of his first name and go by poo poo. <laughs> yeah, well, he could. I mean, yeah. you know, it would get him out Hello. of a lot of trouble. Yeah, it was funny. I was sick of that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Um, well, uh, Dave, I uh, want to thank you for being on. Uh, this has been wonderful. I mean, you're celebrating our first anniversary congratulations it's a, it's a fun thing you're doing this is awesome it's a good thing yeah. oh that's right liz, liz, liz is drinking liz is drinking this is very this rare celebration not only but i am fully vaccinated as a friday so yeah. she's at all congratulations Thank that's you. amazing she's also house trained now so yes yeah. anyone ready for adoption home? I, I mean, I, I've, I've been in the house long enough without going outside. So, yeah. Yeah. I uh, know. We need it. Uh huh. Uh, uh, everyone, if you haven't already, and actually. Oh, if yeah. I, if, I, even I, if you have. I, yeah, even if you have, buy it again. I, I make good coasters. Yeah. These, these books, I mean, I thought these were the staple of every bartender, at least in the U.S., if not the world. Oh, hey, actually, by the way, there was a question about your uh, the Oxford uh, Companion. Um, will it be available in Europe? Yes, it will. So it will be written in European. Uh, no, it'll be written in in, in you know my yeah. bad American, but it'll it'll yeah, it'll you're... it will be available in Europe. Okay, I think there'll be an online edition too. There'll be a there'll the be a, there'll be a digital edition as well. Oh, oh good. Easy yeah, for a lot people. later to carry. People can Easy read for reference, pictures. also. Easy yeah. to search oh, yeah. all the words. Um, and then, obviously, uh, again, what was the name of the uh, – what's the website for the Bar 5? Uh, BeverageAlcoholResource.com. We had to come up with something that spells bar. So. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> Big, uh, airy – no, I don't care. Yeah, that. see, not so no. easy. Yeah. Um, but thank you. Lizard, what's going on next week? Um, before we do, I was just oh. going to say we had one question. Oh, we did? Which was sort of a question. Okay. Um, sort of a question. But from Stephen Crespel, Marty, is that the promo t-shirt for Deadpool? Boom! That's right. De wait. Deadpool L. Yes. So, I, it See, I, I uh, thought it was for Skullapool in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there was a major uh, uh, big box office hit called Skullapool. Hey, no, but there's a, a, there's a town called Skullapool. Yeah. yeah. Uh, great fish and chips. Yeah. 
Oh, phenomenal fish and chips. Anyways, yes, that person wins a uh, hundred autographed uh, <laughs> copies of Lou's <laughs> books delivered personally by Liz. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let me know where you live. <laughs> oh, Walt's right over. I'll just get right on it. And uh, day one, <laughs> yeah, get, get, get the pepperoni on them. Let's <laughs> throw a cocktail on all of them for you. Uh, um, see, I'll gladly do that. See? Yeah. All right. What's going on next what? week? Dave, thank you so much for being a part of our one year. Thank you so much. This was a, this was a hoot. It was a lot of fun. It's great yeah. to see all of you. I can't wait to see you all in person. And yes. uh, yeah, good good break. times. No I'll see you in Jersey City ship. also. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a plan. Yeah. Um, or beyond. You never know. Yeah, yeah. C -cl Classy. <laughs> I might be waiting online on a corner some somewhere in Bayonne when you're driving by. So. <laughs> um, so next week, um, moving ahead, we have uh, our next guest is Heather Green, actually. So another writer, another uh, writer. Another writer. I mean, right? <laughs> did, did you not write part of the Awkward Companion? <laughs> oh, yeah, no. I I know what you. I'm saying. Yep. Too many, too many writers on the dance floor. Boom. <laughs> too many of us. So we'll we'll be we'll out next week. Uh, right, we'll just ask be, her about blending. Right. We'll also be talking to her about Neil and Green. So the new <laughs> distillery down in Texas that she is, of course, spearheading. Um, so it's going to be a, a great conversation. So come back next week, even though we won't be. Celebrating, but it'll be fun. Well, it's a new <laughs> celebration. Well, Heather's yeah. a lot of fun, so it should be good. Yeah. yeah. All right, well, Dave, you're going to get a very, very special uh, first anniversary gift. I can't uh, wait. New, new idea. It's you know what? Yeah. It's yeah, gonna you be new books signed by me. <laughs> oh, now, now you're talking. talking. Now you're talking. Or, or I'll sign a copy of Lou's book and send it to you. There you go. <laughs> Only if there's a pizza involved, right? Like, yeah, it'll be uh, on top of a pizza. Even better. Not on yeah. top of the box, on top of the actual It'll be pizza. the topping for the pizza. Oh, cooked, baked right into it. Yeah. See ya. All, All right, bye, see bye. ya. Bye, all. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Cheers. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs>